Well, I guess uh, last week I was thinking that we were going to do communion, so you kind of want to lead the message into maybe the communion service, and we didn't do communion last week, and uh, this week we're set up, and then I didn't know for sure how it was going to be, but I was going on what Brother Kurt said, we're just going to do communion, doesn't matter how many people here, we can always do it another time too, so where two or three are gathered. He's in the midst, and we are a church, aren't we? So praise the Lord for that. Uh, We are, I want us to look again and try and finish up chapter 4 of Ecclesiastes. And I think, Carol, don't give me that look now. Come on. You love Ecclesiastes now. You do. We all are loving Ecclesiastes, aren't we? We are. We are. We are. Yes. We're just about to finish chapter number 4 and getting into chapter 5 and the great things that God has for us in chapter 5 too. I look forward to those things. Well here the Solomon the preacher again, uh, uh, he's looking at the inequalities of life. Those are the things that we've been looking at for the last several weeks. And as he's looking at underneath the sun, he looked at what we saw several weeks ago now, the oppression of men. Why would man oppress man? And then we move from him looking at uh, oppression to the two men that were striving to outdo the other one. One uh, man who was working hard, another man saw him and was going to try and work harder and get bigger and greater things than he had. And then the competition goes. Both of them are trying to climb up higher than the other one. Then there was that other guy when Solomon then looked, that third fellow that was kind of sitting back by the wayside thinking, those two are fighting for great position, great things. You know, I'm going to do as little as possible in life. I'm going to be kind of lazy, not be motivated, and just barely move on. And then as Solomon took another gander underneath the sun, he saw this man that was all alone. The man all alone. Why would such a man, being so rich, having such great things, choose to be alone and not want to spend some of the things that he has on a family and a wife and relatives and those things? But he was the old miser. We might call him the Ebenezer Scrooge, right? That was who he was. And then uh, Solomon looks uh, again. After he looks and he sees the one man all alone, Last week we looked at, he saw that two men were better than one. Weren't they? Two were greater than one. Two could accomplish a greater labor. Two could be together if one fell. The one could lift him up and help him along. And two together had heat, didn't they? Could produce heat, body heat. And then uh, two could prevail against one. And then even if there was more than two, three, like that threefold cord, oh, we got great strength, don't we? That's why I don't mind if we have small numbers tonight like we do, because we got great strength, don't we? Strength together in the Lord. Well, Solomon takes another look underneath the sun. And I kind of what I titled the message here, he saw kings and peons. Kings and peons. If you follow with me along here in verses, uh, at about 13 on through 16. He says, better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. For out of prison he cometh to reign whereas also he as that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. I considered all the living which walk under the sun with the second child that shall stand up in his stead. There is no end of all the people, even of all that have been before them. They also that come after shall not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Oh, there's that vexation of spirit again, isn't it? Oh, vexation of spirit here. Kings and peons. 
Well, he, he looked and he saw this king, didn't he? Well, well, we see a couple qualities from this king. Qualities here. One of them that we see is that he's old. An old king, isn't he? An old there is ancient elderly. He's an old king and he's looked and saw many days, hasn't he? He's an old man now, but not old, only is he old, but he's foolish, it says. Better is a poor and a wise child than an old, foolish king. Old, foolish man he is. He's that one that hates knowledge anymore. He doesn't want to gain any more knowledge. He doesn't want to delight in understanding anymore. He's been there, done that. He knows everything and he can't be taught anymore. Knowledge. The old Foolish king. And the king is the royal one or the one on the throne. The high position in society. That's where this king was. The old foolish king. High in society here. But notice we see something else about this king. He came from prison. It said he came from prison. For out of prison he cometh to reign. Out of prison. That doesn't mean the prison that you know, he's locked in shackles and he's behind bars because he's done something wrong. He came from bondage. It means he came from a poor life. That's where this king came from. He was a poor man at one time. And he's raised himself up to be the king royal in society. That's what he is. And he's become old and he's become foolish though. Even though he's come from where he is. And look what he's forgot. Look what he's forgot. He forgot where he came from. He forgot where he came from because it says, For out of prison he cometh to reign, whereas also he that is born in his kingdom becometh poor. You would think this man, this great, this king coming from being poor to being a great king in riches, that he would look after the poor in his kingdom. But he doesn't even look at the poor. He forgets where he's come from. You know, as we look at uh, tithing unto the Lord and giving unto the Lord, it's a great delight to give to the Lord. But do you know what the Lord says? He says, if we give to the poor, it's like giving to the Lord, isn't it? Giving to the poor is like giving to the Lord. That's pleasing in his eyes. The old foolish king royal has forgotten about the poor and the needy in his kingdom. Always become a foolish king, hasn't he? But then we look at a little uh, picture. A little picture here of the peon. We have just a little look at the peon. I think I'm a peon sometimes, don't I? I mean, that low person in society, right? The peons. A peon. Well, here he is. But this peon, he's got. Better is a poor and a wise child. He's poor, but yet he's wise. He's poor in the face. He's indigent, destitute of property, property or any comfort of sustenance. He's needy. He's a needy child which is a young man, a needy young man. But yet he's wise. You know why he's wise? Because he's a young man at an age in his life where he's impressionable and he's teachable. He's teachable. That The king here, the king wouldn't be admonished anymore. He wouldn't be taught anything anymore. But here this young man is poor needy, and he's willing to be taught things in the Lord. Great is that, isn't it? When you look for somebody, if you're a leader in a workplace, an employee that you want is one that's teachable. One that's willing to be instructed because that teachable, Brother Kurt agreed with that, he's got men under, somebody that's teachable can become a great person at that workplace for you. But that one that's unteachable can't become a lot at that workplace. 
And he's a child, like I said before, he's a young man at an age where he is still teachable. A teachable young man. Oh, I want to be, I want to be an old man, but I pray that the Lord would still help me to be teachable. And I hope that that would be you wherever you are in your state, like being young or, or old, that God help us to be teachable people in your word, in your ways, and not so set where we are that we miss, Lord, what you want us to be for you. So we see a little example of kings and peons, a king that's gone from being a poor man through the ranks to be king royal and forgotten about those that are still where he began. And then we got this young child that's impressionable and teachable. But you know what Solomon sees here? And he finally calls it vanity again and vexation of spirit. He says, I considered all the living which walk under the sun, verse 15, with the second child that shall stand up in his, stead, in his stead. So he's looking at the king where he's gone, but yet the child, that, that young one that's going to ascend and be in his place. But yet the child that shall stand up in his stead. But at, as he looks at the child then that's going to stand in the stead, he says on verse 16, he says, There is no end of all the people, even of all of all that have been before them, they also that cometh after shall not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. You see, there was people that didn't like the king royal. The king. Because he was unteachable and how he'd gotten in his life. But, you know, Solomon saw the young child that was going to go from being the poor. And he was going to take the throne and be the king. But you know what he saw with that man too, underneath the sun? That that man was going to be right where the other king was. He was going to gain and get money, and he was going to become unteachable. So he says, it's all vanity, and it's all vexation of spirit. It doesn't matter if you're a king or a peon. The peon's going to be the same place. That's underneath the sun. The S-U-N, isn't it? But you know, we've got, we've got somebody that's the S-O-N. The S-O-N. And you know, I want to reflect as we, as we get ready for uh, communion here. I want us to look at this son. Our king Jesus and where he came from. But he was different than the king that we see in Ecclesiastes. Different than the king underneath the S-U-N or the young child that then became that king that went from the poor state under the S-U-N because they both would become the same. But the Lord Jesus left glory for you and I. I want to I wanna read a few scriptures, just contemplating, thinking about our Lord Jesus Christ as we move to communion. Our Jesus left heaven's glory. In John 1, we read that when we were sharing this afternoon with uh, Abraham and Shaniel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The same was in the beginning with God. Our Lord Jesus is God, was in the beginning, was in glory, has always existed, but for a period of time, for you and I, left glory to come here and take on the flesh of a man 
in remembering. I'm going to look at a place in Luke. All this is just reflection because I believe every one of us here tonight is a believer. But remembering that our Lord was born in a manger as a baby. Luke 2, verse 7 says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And then verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And our Thursday Bible study, we were talking a little bit of seeing an example of a, of a child and how we can see right off the bat in a young child that they're a sinner. And I, I reflected on our two grandkids, that Caden, eight months old, when he doesn't get his way, will arch his back. And start screaming. Oh you can see the sin nature in him. Or Janessa. When her mama tells her not to touch something. She looks at her mama. And she moves that hand right out. Looking at mama. And touches what she's told. Not to touch. The sin nature. But we reflected on Thursday. That our Lord Jesus Christ. Being perfect means that he was a perfect baby, means that he was a perfect child at age two, where he wasn't in the terrible twos, but was obedient unto his parents, not one, not ever disobeying. Our Lord, that's him. We have to cross that in our mind, and that's kind of tough, but it's true. A baby born in a manger. He was a young man of age 12 in Luke chapter 2 and verse 48 here. We know when his mom and dad had left or Mary and Joseph had left and finally decide and realize that Jesus isn't with them. We better go back and find him. Where is he at? And when they saw him, verse 48 says, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wist you know that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. What I want you to begin to see is a poor man. A poor boy. You see, our Lord Jesus Christ was rich in the heavenly glory, but here in the flesh he grew up in a poor family. He grew up in a poor family. We know that he was poor by Luke 2, 21, verse 21. I want to read that to us. Luke 2, 21. Right after Jesus, right when Jesus was born, it says, And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, Every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. That was a poor man's offering. Our Lord always allowed the poor or the rich to be able to come and offer. That's how we know that he grew up in a family that was poor, was by the offering that they could only Produce for the cleansing. Our Lord Jesus Christ grew up as a poor boy, but yet rich. We see him in 
as we move uh, through Luke here and get to chapter 3 again, we see him being anointed as king. He was anointed as king. Luke 3, 21 says, it's his baptism. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened and the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee am I well pleased. The anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ, the beginning of His public ministry. Anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ as King. And then our King entered Jerusalem. He entered Jerusalem in Luke 19 in verse 35. And they brought him to Jesus and they cast their garments upon the colt and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their, their clothes in the way and when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for the almighty works that they had seen, for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if they, if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. King Jesus comes in lowly as a servant too, doesn't he? On a colt into Jerusalem. He entered Jerusalem as king. He was rejected as the king. In Luke 23, verse 13, says, And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, You have brought this man unto, unto me as one that perverteth the people, and behold, I have examined him. Before you and found no fault in this man touching those things whereof you accuse him. Nor, no, nor yet Herod. For I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For of a necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. And they cried out, they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore, willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, Why, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will, therefore, chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. You can hear it ringing, can't you? Crucify him. Crucify him. Oh, he was rejected, but yet he also received a crown. I thank, I thank him for the crown that he received. And I want to Look at the crown that he received for a minute. This is the crown, though, of the uh, thorns. The crown of thorns that he took on for you and me. I'm going to look at that in John 19. Verse 1 through 3 says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail! King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Our Lord Jesus took on a crown of thorns. But you know, he was different than the king that we've looked at here in Ecclesiastes. 
He came from the poor. He ascended to be the greatest king. But you know the king that we looked at in Ecclesiastes forgot about the poor. But you know our Lord Jesus Christ did not forget about the poor. I want to go back to Luke 23 and look at a little place here. Luke 23, verse 34. Verse 33 says, And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified Him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Didn't forget about the poor or anybody else. But Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He received a nameplate, didn't he? In verse 38 it says, And the superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the King of the Jews. He had a nameplate, didn't he? This is the King of the Jews. He made the ultimate sacrifice for us in John 15, 13. I want to, the ultimate sacrifice that anyone can make. What it says here is, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Made it the ultimate sacrifice for you and me. And you know what else he did in John 14? Something that the king in Ecclesiastes didn't do. You see, he didn't make the ultimate sacrifice for the poor, did he? He, didn't, he, he forgot about the poor. But not only that, our King Jesus secured a mansion for you and me, didn't he? John 14 one says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are, ma house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. He didn't forget about you or I, the poor, but He's securing a place for you and I, isn't He? In heaven, our King Jesus is a greater King than we saw in Ecclesiastes because He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the S-O-N. I appreciate Brother Kurt bringing that out. He's the S-O-N for us, isn't He? And I want to move us right into communion. And I, I'm going to ask Brother Kurt to come up here and, and Brother Dick, if I can,